here probably already know Dom, but I don't, but anyway. So Dom is uh, going to be talking to us on QRP and making antennas when in DX. Um, over to Dom. Thank you. Uh, the title should have actually been QRP and making antennas work when in DX, but... <laughs> Never mind. Um, I guess some people know me, some people don't. I originally trained as a mountain guide, that's that one of the reasons why I love the idea of QRP. If you can't carry it, you don't take it. It's that simple. Um, I don't believe in these big mega the expeditions that seem to have sort of containers full of kit and linears and towers and all the rest of it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Keep it small, keep it light, carry it in, carry it out, leave nothing but your footprints. It's that simple. So that's, that's the ethos I've been working on ever since I've been a radio amateur and beforehand. So. Um, that was actually taken, believe it or not, I'm actually in my underwear there. Basically, it was about minus 20 at the time, but it was um, so hot in the sun. Um, didn't wear it. Right, what's DX? Um, if some of you have seen the RSGB convention um, talks and all the rest of it, I asked a similar question. So I'll ask everyone here. How many people have actually ever operated outside the shack, away from antennas? How many people know ESNEX software? Show of hands, roughly. I would advise if you haven't ever used it, I'll have a slide. Go and have a look at it and have a play around, even with a demo version. It runs under Windows. Okay, everyone knows a quarter wave ground plane. Uh, I'm going to cover a multiple hand dipole, a two element vertical array, a four square. Does anyone do any satellite operating? Um, a buddy pole is actually a commercial antenna, but it's amazing what other extras you can make, and some of them I've actually brought with myself with me today, which do make a difference to your operating. Um, ESNEC, as again, some of you didn't <coughs> say you knew it, just ESNEC.com, very simple. Um, the latest version is actually really good. If you want to get involved in looking, um, I was suggesting to some of the guys recently when they were building some ground plane verticals, turn around and get the guys to turn around and take the same verticals they've been using inland, now go and take it by the beach and see what the differences are. Um, the reason why is this. You can very, very simply model <coughs> what your antennas are. Everyone knows, quarter wave ground plane. It's transmit and receive in 360 degrees all the way around. If you happen to have a good ground plane, basically, this lobe here drops down towards the, to a much, much lower angle, angle of radiation than receive from home. Okay, how many people have done it when they're on holiday? Okay, there's a few, so a few of you know what we're talking about. Okay, um, there are some people who turn around a real purist who turn around and say, unless you're at least a thousand miles away from home, basically, it's not DX and it doesn't count. Um, likewise, if you're not in your own DXCC, so basically um, that's where we're talking about. But having just heard the, the LF talk, basically, if, you, if you're portable and you're probably only about 20 or 30 miles away down the road and you're not in your shack and so you've got to take everything with you, basically, I, I think I regard that as, as DX as well sometimes. Right, um, I'm only going to try and whistle through these as fast as I can. Some of these things will be absolutely obvious, some of them won't be. Um, but it also runs under Linux, so you can actually run it. It's a very, very easy, cheap way of being able to very, very quickly model an antenna and figure out what works and what doesn't. It's that simple. Anyone? A couple, okay, I may, may or may not have it. There's an antenna called an Arrow. It's actually quite an expensive antenna. It's actually cross on both um, 70 stems and 2 meters, basically. I ended up actually making a clone of it when I was actually on one of my trips, and I'll show you some slides of that as well. And to see how your antennas you've currently got work or how they should be working in theory, this is a really good way of doing it. It's also really good if you actually do some investigation to figure out what the conductivity is of the ground where you are at home, or say if you'd move the same thing to say 10 miles down the road if you happen to be near a beach, and see how does the same antenna work there. Um, for yourself, do it, do it in modeling so you don't have to literally you know, get in the car and do it, but it's amazing what the differences can make, and you can see them very, very easily. Um, so it works really, really well. But the thing is, you've got absolutely no receive capability from one direction or another, or another. Now, if you happen to be a QRP operator and you're DX, being able to actually differentiate from one direction or another from on receive, not transmit, is vitally important, believe me. So um, anyway, so that's the quarter wave ground plane. Um, when I was in um, uh, Sweden, um, there's a whole pile of islands, Iota, and I, get, I love going to the Iota contest. I use, I use contests myself because what I tend to do is I go for the contest and I stay for a couple of days out of side. The main reason I do that is it's amazing how many little, uh, little island stations or other DXCCs you can pick up, especially if you, they know you're there. Plus the fact, having a nice short call sign helps as well. Um, 
This here is actually a salt marsh. Um, I didn't realise, but until um, someone turned around and told me, I went out. It was a bit soggy as I went out there, and as I was putting it up, someone turned around and pointed out to me, you do realise it's 30 foot deep out there? <laughs> but um, I was actually on salt marsh. It's actually where the, um, the sheep go and do the necessary, but I didn't realise that. But it's a lovely ground plane. Um, so whilst I might have had sort of like black up to my knees, basically, the RF signals worked really, really well. Um, the sky, pi the pictures look wonderful, but in real terms, basically, this is actually a 40 metre ground plane which I actually strapped to the, my operating hut. That's the other thing, is they've got little huts all over the place. The, um, how do I put it? What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to fly the host flag above your flag. So what actually happened is there was a little Swedish pennant above this, but the, um, there was a storm that went through just beforehand, so the Swedish pennant got blown off. <laughs> um, it's a military island, so I kid you not, what actually happened is we had a couple of Swedish military guys turn up and actually ask what was going on because we thought we'd invaded. <laughs> um, anyway, that is that ground plane there, 40 metre ground plane. I had um, 10 metre and 50 metre dipoles coming off here. I was actually also using them as guides, and that's a nice little 6 metre, three, 3 element Yagi. So, they do, they do work. Um, many people ever had, a, had or used a multi-pan dipole? Before? No? Okay. I decided to see how light could I actually make these things. And so uh, that is actually that antenna, all made up. So I've actually done DX trips where basically that's the entire antenna I've, I've taken with me. Uh, each of the individual bands itself, there it says traps, which you can... Soto Beam's downstairs, he's got traps, so you can actually add them if you want to. But um, ev everyone knows what an Anderson power pole is? I did it the other way, basically, where instead of actually get involving the trap in the, in the discussions of how, long, how, the, how big the separations have got to be, where the traps were, basically, there's black box, I just put an Anderson power pole. So if I want to operate on 15 metres, I literally just connect all the sections together. People do it with crocodile clips and all sorts. But it basically means, from a QRP perspective, you can make that on site, and I did. And it works. Dead simple. Um, that was actually in about 2006 or thereabouts. So I'd have been licensed only about three or four years, so I didn't really know what I was doing at that point. Um, this is one thing, the title was about making antennas when I'm somewhere else. Um, I don't know if you can see, but I, I, I reference uh, G4ATA and 2E1FES for this one. Everyone knows basically the modeling program I told you before. If you've got a one single ground plane, basically it's 360 degrees. You put another ground plane within the same field, in other words, near field, it starts to become a parasite. parasite. So basically you can move it around, basically, and effectively sometimes you can, get some sort of, um, you can get advantages in one direction or another. When I was in um, uh, South Cooks, I was operating the Biru contest on a 40 meter ground plane, so I had absolutely no receive capability whatsoever from any direction, which means as soon as I was trying to actually work anywhere in the UK, I could hear everyone from Japan Everyone from North America, everyone from Australia, and everyone from New Zealand, all at the same time. So they didn't work for me. So as soon as the contest finished, because I was going to be there for a couple of days afterwards, I decided to turn around and actually make this antenna on site, and I did. So this, this, is, this is the only little box I actually purchased on site. Um, and believe it or not, um, South Cooks is that used to be belong to um, New Zealand. So they had a J-car, a bit like a Maplin. So we went in, basically picked a tiny little box, basically made an antenna. And um, just to show you what it's like, um, this is the, the coax that was being used is 9913. It's bel uh, Belbin, and that's, its, um, that's what the distance should have been for the velocity factor to actually work out the sort of uh, uh, quarter wave, etc. But this is in the tropics where it's 85% humidity and 35 degrees. And I'm sure, as everyone knows, basically, once you've had your coax, you've been sitting outside for a while, basically, it doesn't actually keep that velocity factor for very long. So what we had to do is actually um, use... I may have a slide for it, but I don't know. I go on trips with one of these little things, which basically allows me to, to work out what the velocity factor is of the, co of the coax, or an actual fact, work out what the proper quarter wave wavelength length is. So I don't care, really, what the, what the velocity factor is. It's this long, cut it, and there you go. So it works. Um, and I put, set this all up. Um, how many people read Radcom? Many people? Recently there was a write-up in, um, in it about the, the Biru contest, about the fact that I'd operated, and um, I destroyed the linear when I was out there, which I did. Um, 
accidentally, but um, in addition to that, also this feeder here, piglets ate it. <laughs> um, there'll be a photograph a little bit later in the presentation, you'll see. Um, it was snaked across um, a field outside the property where I was. What we didn't realise is early in the morning, basically, there was like a um, forest, for want of a better word. The mother pigs used to bring the little piglets down to the shoreline to basically to feed. I'd put something down and they all decided to gnaw through it. <laughs> it's probably a good job I wasn't trying to work anyone at the time. Okay, um, as I said, jumping around a little bit. I provide these for you if anyone emails and asks me for details, but basically, remember before I turned around and said, no, there's no directivity effectively on a ground plane. One of the things I, I've become a bit of a fan on is actually phasing antennas because, it, because of the advantages it makes for me. There's something called the Foursquare. Now, to be honest, if you go to any of the big sort of like magazines, etc., they'll turn around and tell you all about Foursquare systems, and they'll be charging you something in the region of about £1,000 in total for the entire system. It's a lot of rot. Sorry, but basically, they don't cost that much. Um, the linear, I've got a photograph. I actually spilt a can of Fanta on it. <laughs> um, the thing is, in the cam hams, there's a bit of a joke that one of the guys, basically, um, is always seems to be spilling his Fanta whenever he goes field days and all the rest of it. I thought it's never going to happen to me. I put the Fanta on top of the linear, and the next thing you hear, turn around, basically, exactly that. I pulled the cable, and the cannon went over. Oops, never mind. Um, unfortunately, it was a very expensive mistake, but never mind. Right, um, four square. Basically, it's all about the, the antennas in the, fir in the first instance. There's four of them for obvious reasons. What I use is, again, Soto Beams has got them downstairs. It's a 10 meter pole. As everyone knows, a 10 meter pole is a wonderful support for a 40 meter, 40 meter um, antenna. So basically, four of those, four ground screws, sorted out in the appropriate separation, etc., effectively, and you, you've got the basics of an antenna. Now, don't get me wrong, but um, it's nice for the commercial guys, but I can't possibly see how that costs the amount of money they're asking for it. Okay, the next bit you need to do, and this is where the, the science bits come in, this is going to be the least technical presentation, but basically what you need to do is you need to follow those sort of formulas. Yeah. What you need to do is you need to work out, what you're doing is you're inputting signal here and you're phasing it appropriately and sending it to the different antennas. What it actually looks like is one of those. Now this is actually able to take an awful lot more than QRP power. You can actually put a kilowatt into this, this if you need to, because that's how I, why I built it. Um, and it's very, very simple. You, you, you plug in the values, sort out the formulas. There's even a spreadsheet on the guy's website to actually help you do this. So you can work out what all the, what all the um, values are for the, uh, the T1 and T2, which are the phasing transformers and the capacitors. And then lo and behold, you actually get your signals coming out here. Bit more to that. If anyone knows me, they may know my blog website. You effect, what I've effectively done is I've turned around and actually fed these signals into an oscilloscope. And you, know, you can actually follow the phase difference as you adjust the, the tuning, the, 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 the inductance. One of the important bits on it is a dummy load. Again, simple, simple cheap box. I should probably take the cover off, but basically inside there's a chip resistor that c comes out here. And in addition to that, basically I've got a nice little sort of um, um, transformer which turns around and tells me how much RF is coming back in to the dummy load, so I know exactly how, how efficient the antenna is. I've tested this one, this particular one, if you've got a kilowatt coming out here, you've got less than 10 watts coming into your dummy load, which basically means all of your power is going out of your antenna. And depending on exactly which, how you're switching, ha, ha, which, sorry, which direction you've chosen, you're either going to be receiving or transmitting, say, towards the UK, towards New Zealand, Australia, whatever else. It, it works. It, it works. It's very, very simple. Unfortunately, I haven't got any audio recordings. I did mean to bring them with me, but I forgot. But it's very, very, if you say um, you're receiving a signal from America, just change the direction and all of a sudden the signal from America disappears and up comes the signal from Japan on exactly the same frequency. Switch again, the signal from Japan disappears and up comes the signal from Australia. Again, you can't hear Americans either. It's, it's, phenomen it's one of those things that I, I would suggest if anyone wants to have a crack at doing here in the UK, have a crack at building a four square if you haven't. Actually, how many people have actually got one? Anyone? No. A four square? No. No, okay. It's, worth, it's worthwhile having a look at if you, if you haven't got one. Okay. Right. 
And to give you an idea of what it physically looks like, that's me standing by one of, the, one of them. The other one's over there. There'll be another one about here and another one here for 40 metres. So that's what I did there. Again, that's a switch box, a dummy load, control cables. Um, I did the same thing again for 30 metres and I ran Wispy light trans transmitter permanently whilst I was out in South Cooks on using a four square. Um, so with, I think it was 20 milliwatts, I was able to get to the east coast of America with using, using that. So it does work. Um, very important to have a decent ground plane, so um, I left this out there. But you make up a very, very simple sort of square of aluminium, connect whatever wires you've got, make a ground plane, etc. Um, this is actually 30 metres, so what I've actually got is the feed point is actually about 2.4 metres above ground. And so this is what it, what it actually looks like. This is what the, the, the ground planes look like. The reason why the antenna wire is actually rotated round the, the mast, has anyone seen those um, uh, chimneys by factories, etc.? Where basically, um, it, it never makes an awful lot of sense. You've got fins on the outside of them. The reason it's very simple is if you get a wind from one direction, it, it, it creates a sort of a, a vortex type um, torsion in, in the mast itself, which basically means the mast stays vertical. You hardly need any guying whatsoever on these. Hardly ever. But you do need some, basically, for the wind to get up a little bit. Any questions? No? Anyway, so that's what I did in... in. Uh, does anyone want to hear about the arrow clone? No? Okay. Um, having gone through all of the, the details of um, sorting out the separation of the antenna, etc., um, to cut my luggage down, because I had to actually pay for the luggage to be taken out and then taken back again, I decided I um, might as well cut down on costs. So I had one of these, which cost £1.50. Um, I cut it up. Um, has anyone done um, 80 metre um, direction finding? Well, basically, you turn around and take a steel ruler and basically attach it to a plastic pole. It's exactly the same theory, effectively, wi with, with basically an arrow antenna. Effectively, what you do is you have... Um, a, it's a three element on two metres and a seven element on um, 70 cents. Um, unfortunately, South Cooks is there. When the, any of the uh, satellites passed over, I wasn't going to be able to actually work anyone, so it was a bit, of a bit of a waste of time. But what I did notice is the um, International Space Station several times went straight over the top. There wasn't an amateur on board at the time, but what I was able to actually do is actually tune in, and I was listening to the, um, the uplink to and from Houston while they were telling the guys to do things, which was great fun. Um, and the locals absolutely loved it. Um, jumping around quite a bit, um, last year I did a, a contest down in uh, the City Isles. Um, I actually grew up in Cornwall, so basically the City Isles was my stomping ground as a kid. Um, it's a bit difficult to see, but that's one, and one side of a tooth, uh, of a, a foot. I was putting this up at the time the guy took the photograph, but basically those are two uh, portions of a, um, a two, two element array on 40 metres. And in that direction there, is straight towards, Ameri to, to, towards America. That direction is straight towards the UK. So effectively, I was able to actually switch from one to the other on a regular, ba on a rapid basis. And to give you an idea, that's what 20 meters looked like on that antenna. Remember, 40 meter two phase direct, and that's 20 meters. No tuner, by the way. And that's what um, 40 meters looked like. I took these with this, which is a little um, software-defined receiver. Plant a little radio, basically. I take it with me. The reason I do that is because I normally operate whoop, with one of these. And while I'm doing that, on one of the other antennas, I connect an SDR. So I can actually see what the activity is like. So if all of a sudden the activity increases in one band I'm interested in, I can change the antenna and start working with that one, and et cetera, et cetera. It makes a lot of difference. It makes it much more efficient. Um, let me see. I am ripping through this pretty quick. Body pole. Um, there we go, one I, one I assembled earlier. Right. It's a nice simple antenna and there's lots and lots of different configurations you can put this in. I tend to prefer using it in an L shape like this, which basically means you've got a tuning coil here, another one here, and whips, I've got to be very careful, it's a bit unstable, here and there. So effectively what it means is you can actually make it into, an, into a resonant antenna at the frequencies you want. 
And because of the fact we've got a capability of actually either making it horizontal, vertical, L-shaped, V, upside down, there, there's a whole load of different combinations. Remember the ESNIC modeling program? Put, the, put that into the ESNIC modeling program and from your, from your specific location, have a look and see what difference it makes. Anyway, that's, that's how I prefer using it. Have I used it? Yes. Um, I know I work some G stations, and I know some of them are from this part of the world. How many people actually worked me when I was in Gambia? Anyone from here? No. Okay, um, that's the Gambian mainland, and this is the sandbar that's three miles out into the Atlantic. Um, I literally got dropped off by a fishing boat, basically. I had a total of 95, 96 minutes to be um, active, whilst the sea had gone down before it then came back in again. So it was very, very important to actually get out, get an antenna up and start operating really, really quickly. I turned around and told people I was actually going to be there and active. So from just QRP, and this is SSB, not CW, um, from the first QSO, sorry, from the first CQ that went out to the first QSO was about 90 seconds, which is actually quite a lot of fun. I mean, everyone says QRP, you're never going to get anything if you call CQ, but I did in that case. Um, and it carried on until basically the boat came back to pick me up. But what was even more fun basically is, see the little um, uh, dip in the, 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 the shrubbery there? There's a hotel just there, so basically when the, when, when the tide came in basically, I took the boat juicefully back, back went and sat, on, sat in a bar um, having a drink, thinking, great, this is brilliant, no problems at all. The next thing I know, I'm in West Africa by the way, my mobile phone goes off. I'm going, hang on a second, these guys haven't got tarmac on the roads. My phone, mobile phone's just gone. I pick it up, there's a guy in California turning around saying, we missed you, when are you going to go back out again? <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the day, I went back to the fishing guys basically and asked them, could they take me back out again? So we had to wait for the tide get to go down. And, they, and this time, because it was going to be dark by the time I'd finished, um, they stayed offshore. Anyway, it works. Um, if I'd had the time, what I would have liked to have done is actually taken one of my ground planes or four squares out there because you, can you imagine what it's going to be like a four square in the middle of the Atlantic with that sort of ground plane? It'd be brilliant fun. Anyway, maybe next time. Um, a lot of people have asked this, how do I do? I mean, have I actually done so far, basically? Um, apart from that one there, those are actual QSL cards I've received, not the number of QSOs I've put in the log. Um, so it's not a bad figure. It's, it's, um, most of those activations are only over about... a a week or two at most, and it's spread over about, a, about an eight or nine year period. So, um, when, you talk, when you speak to people in the DX community, they sort of like poo poo QRP guys, but I floored a few people with this list. Um, also, um, I think I've done all right in some of the contests as well. <laughs> okay. Again, I've whistled right through this really, really quickly, but has anyone got any questions? Uh, uh, let me phrase it this way. There's no such thing as a stupid question, and if you don't want to ask it in the audience, you can email me. That's fine as well. But. Dom, have you got any figures on the sort of front-to-back ratio on the four square? Uh, I can find it for you, Stephen. I will let you. But it, 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 it's, it's quite incredible. I wouldn't say it's 25 dB, but it's of that sort of level. Um, uh, it, it, the first time, if you ever hear it, I wish I'd brought the audio recording, because the first time you ever hear it, you are able to actually switch on the same frequency from one direction to another one. And you, for one second you can hear a, hear a station, and the next one you can't. It's, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, the first time I ever actually got involved in using a three-element Yagi, I couldn't believe the capabilities on receive from a directional antenna. If you've never had the ability to actually use an antenna like that before, it's a revelation. And for me, it really was. I've got a photograph which I can try and bring up or you can have a look, basically. The switch, it's dead easy. Um, I asked the local mechanic if he could turn around and actually just drill holes in it. And I kid you not, in my go bag, which is just down there, um, I actually carry a pile of bits whenever I tend to go to some of these locations because I know, you know, Murphy's Law is going to break something. Um, uh, I did a trip to um, uh, Stewart Island and the entire trip was almost a disaster, but for... Um, one PL259 to BNC adapter I'd forgotten. Um, we ended up actually getting some guys in um, uh, lo local amateurs actually went running around 
trying to see one if did anyone have one in their box, or, and we ended up getting an AV guy to actually make one up for me. But it, it, it can be done, and to be honest, but it's a case of you've got to be um, a bit, you've got, you've got to think a bit laterally. Um, you need someone who's got a drill press, who can drill a hole, and just about anyone can do that. Um, if you need an antenna fixed, especially if it's aluminium, just about most of these places have got people who can weld. Um, you'd be surprised the number of cars, in, especially in the third world, they may put silencers on the cars, but they don't replace them, they just fix them. How do you get by the packing for the expedition? How do I get by? Um, well, it, it's got to fit in the bag for starters. Um, sorry? The four pull? The four pull. Um, they're 560 grams each. Um, these are about the same weight. Um, if I start getting into close to the total allowance uh, for the weight you take, yeah. um, not be funny, the toothbrush gets cut in half because you go down to one t-shirt. Um, the last thing you ever jettison is any radio kit. <laughs> um, but the thing is, it's again, um, I, I knew what I was doing when I went to, to South Cooks. I took out antennas with me because the person I stayed with, basically, <coughs> I knew he needed certain things. So I took a big bag of things out there and then left it there. So I was lucky in that case. But um, it's possible these days to literally sort of, depending on your airline routes, et cetera, to probably get, especially if you go around America, twice <coughs> times 32 kilos. I'd be hard challenged to turn around and carry 64 kilos for very far. Yeah. yeah. It, it's hard work, but you can do it. Yeah. You, you, you don't, I don't tend to carry things like power supplies. Um, you get a motorcycle battery when you're somewhere. Um, it's very, very, diff very, very easy in most places to probably find a wall wart or something. My little bag of bits, etc. You take a little th uh, LM317 or something like that. You make the dirtiest charger on earth, basically. You plug into a wall wart, basically, and you can recharge your, 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 your car battery. Um, do you use texting badges for most of these routes? Yes. Uh, these days, it's almost impossible not to. Um, when I did the flight back from um, uh, South Cooks, we came via Singapore. I don't know if anyone's flown recently, but basically they've done a, a yeah, it was, there was, okay, it was uh, South Cooks to, well, uh, to Auckland, Auckland to Sydney, Sydney to, to Singapore, Singapore back to London. And at the time, the, 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 the suggestion had just gone through from the customs in the UK that um, they weren't allowing anyone to fly with anything electronic in their carry-on baggage larger than a sort of like a, an old laptop, uh, sorry, an old, uh, an old um, calculator, uh, which is a bit, of a bit of a nightmare. So to be honest, you just put it in check, check baggage. I've flown thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. I've never lost a bag. So. Uh, no problem. Oh, yes. Lots. Um, <laughs> the last time I went to Gambia, I flew out of Gambia into Morocco to then fly somewhere else at 3 o'clock in the morning. And trying to fly out of some airport at 3 o'clock in the morning when you've just turned around and declared your bags got transmitted. Yeah, so um, you can have problems, but 9 times out of 10 you don't. The biggest fun is when you fly through America, because 9 times out of 10 the person who's a security guy is a radio amateur anyway. He will hold you up because he's interested. You're the first interesting passenger he's had. And he will ask you every possible question you can think of. Um, I once took, mistakenly, a, a kit with a whole load of toroids in it, um, which for obvious reasons, when that goes through an x-ray machine, all the alarm bells go off like nobody's business. Um, and I had to do an impromptu session explaining what impedance transformers were all about. I then discovered afterwards, one of the guys turned around and said, wonderful, you can come to our club and give a talk next week. <laughs> So, um, by the way, I talk to everyone, so um, it's, it's amazing. Um, <coughs> most of these people are absolutely bored stupid. They're literally sort of like doing this all day with people. So if they stop or they find something interesting, they'll, they'll talk to you. So. Some of them, yeah, um, some of them are a problem. Some of them take a while. Some of them are very, very simple indeed. There's, um, something called CPT, which basically means you can go to most places in the world and you operate their uh, call sign prefix slash your home call, and then usually if you're portable, slash P. Unfortunately, if it's CW, that's an incredibly long call sign. Um, so if you keep going back to some of these places, you can actually end up asking them, instead of operating CPT, can you give you a real call sign? That's one, one aspect. 
Some places have got almost no real licensing authority whatsoever. So what you have to do is you have to learn and be, you know, think laterally a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm an IT person as well now, and I've travelled globally, and I know that usually when you get involved in dealing with people who are dealing with other um, uh, communications or telephones or mobile phones or something like that, they will usually involve some sort of local legal firm. So a number of times I've actually got in touch with local legal firms and asked them, did they have a contact or a partner or something who'd been dealing with the local communications people? I did that in Gambia. Cut a long story short, I ended up being able to speak to the person, so I think I was used as a conduit for about 18 people to actually get the licenses in Gambia after that. So it does work. But it's, it's, um, it's, some places are a bit difficult to get licenses, some places are a little bit easier. You just have to ask questions. Mm -hmm. The only place I've actually been declined a license is Diego Garcia. But that's because the Americans wouldn't let me land. Anything else? No? Just a quick factual thing. Uh, EasyNEC uh, is not ESNEC. ESNEC? It's, well, the, uh, it is EZ. EZNEC, yeah. 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 OK. Yeah. OK, well, thank you very much, Dom. A uh, one-man invasion. Um, defeated by piglets and uh, then off to the uh, get your feet wet on an island that's flooding in uh, yes put your trust in a fisherman okay <laughs> so thanks Thank you. Thank you. okay I'll thank you the next talk is in uh, a few minutes I'll <laughs> try and bring up that photograph for you if you can see it very briefly it's all obvious just because